Well, welcome uh, everyone. Um, I think we've still got a couple of more people that may be wanting to uh, attend and we'll welcome them when they come. Uh, but we do want to um, start right on time. So as it is uh, seven o'clock, I'll, I'll say welcome uh, to the EPA 20B conference uh, for the Long Worry Sale Yards proposal. Uh, so a very warm welcome to you all and we're very excited to have you on board uh, for our very first online version of a 20B uh, conference. So strap yourself in for a very exciting ride. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we uh, are tuning into this meeting and I pay my respects to their elders past and present and the elders from other communities who may be here today. Uh, my name's Kath Botter and I'm an independent consultant. I'm based in Benalla, so tuning in from Benalla tonight. And my role is to be the independent chair for the 20B conference tonight. Uh, so the purpose uh, of the conference tonight is twofold. Um, is for the EPA and for the proponent uh, to gain a better understanding of community views, concerns and issues that need to be considered as part of the approvals process. And secondly, to identify potential ideas and options for conditions that the EPA uh, could consider that may resolve the issues and concerns or at least reduce some of the impacts if the works approval is issued. So my role tonight is not to make a judgment on the proposal, nor is the role of the conference to make a judgment on the proposal um, or to come to a consensus view, but it's really to ensure that we all are able to understand the range of views in the community about the proposal and that we do identify some potential ideas that the EPA could consider in its assessment of the works approval application. So there are our our two key tasks for, for tonight. The conference, in fact, has had two parts to it. Uh, the online forum, which was open for community input and comment from the 27th of April and closed on Monday, and then tonight's online event. So I'd like to thank and acknowledge the input of participants in the online forum, because your input has greatly helped to focus our agenda tonight and also to those participants that made a submission. Um, I do want to work with you to ensure that the conference process tonight is effective and useful for all people involved. And we are uh, using a, a, a different uh, mode tonight um, as online. So just a few thoughts for you around guidelines for um, success. Um, you can use the Q&A function, I've put chat function there, but apparently it's the Q&A function to contribute your perspective to the conference. Um, so I just ask that you demonstrate a level of courtesy and respect to others in your contribution. And I should say that um, the Q&A function will be moderated tonight. Uh, and all of the contributions that are made into the Q&A function uh, can be captured and I'll use them as part of my uh, role, which is to write a conference report. The second one there is that we do want to ensure that we capture the diversity and range of views in the process. Um, so it's, I want to just emphasize that it's not about uh, repeating what has already been said in the, in the submissions and in the forum. We now really want to work with you to just double check, have we got it all uh, in terms of issues or concerns from your perspective? That doesn't mean you have to agree with everything you hear, but it's an important part of the process to ensure that we've got all of those views on the table. And the third one there is that we do want to ensure that we finish um, on time at around eight o'clock, uh, knowing that an hour of your time of an evening is very precious time we don't want to take any more time on that. So we need to use our time wisely. So I'm asking you to stay on topic, 
keep your contributions brief, uh, but also keep them focused on those issues that are within the scope um, of EPA. And we will um, talk a little bit more about what are those issues that are in the scope of EPA and what's out of scope in a moment. So just in terms of our process tonight, how we're going to run it, um, I'm going to uh, in a minute hand to Steve from EPA just to give uh, the context in terms of the 20B conference as part of the uh, approvals process. I'm going to introduce our speakers tonight. I'm going to give you a brief run through of the key issues and concerns that have already been raised in the submissions and a summary of um, those issues that have been raised in the forum process. We'll then have a Q&A based on the questions that came through from the forum. Um, and then we want to hear community perspectives. Uh, so I've asked two people to give a community perspective. We can't hear from everyone verbally. Um, so it's at that point that I will invite you to put your perspective forward on our two main objectives tonight uh, using the Q&A function on your screen. And then we'll finish with what are the next steps uh, from here in terms of the EPA process. So I think that's about it. Uh, so we, I think we should take off and, uh, and fly this plane. Uh, so first, uh, firstly, we now want to go to just getting the context of the 20B conference as part of the approvals process. And uh, for that, we've got um, Stephen Adams-Waite uh, from the EPA to just give us that context. Over to you, Stephen. Okay, thanks, Kath. Hopefully everybody can see and hear me okay. Uh, so just, I guess, quick introduction. My name's Stephen Adams-Waite. I'm the Unit Manager for Development and Assessments. And it's my team within EPA that conduct these works approval assessments. So I'll just try and quickly cover the question of well, what is a 20B and how does it fit in with the works approval process? 20B conference, which obviously normally happens face to face, but we're doing slightly differently tonight, uh, is an engagement step within the works approval process that is essentially a culmination of the engagement that we've uh, already undertaken with the community. And so tonight is about trying to, as Kath sort of already alluded to, make sure we've covered off on our understanding of the community's concerns mm -hmm. and having this kind of process along with some of the other engagement steps that have already occurred, like people having the opportunity to make submissions. This ensures that EPA can address your concerns during our assessment. I guess just to confirm, there's no decision will be made at this conference. It really is all about us gathering information from you. At the end of this conference and you know, subsequent to tonight, an independent report will get written uh, by CAF, and then this report will, will be considered by EPA during our assessment. If anyone has further queries on that, please uh, post some questions in the, the Q&A box. But otherwise, back to you, CAF. Okay, thanks, uh, thanks, Stephen. So I'll move now just to um, introduce you to the key people that are speaking tonight. Um, so in terms of uh, EPA, we've heard from um, Stephen Adams-Waite and Stephen will come back and have a bit more of a chat to us, particularly around clarification of issues that are within and without, out, outside the uh, EPA scope. Uh, we have Dale Thornburn, who's not actually speaking tonight, but he's in the background, um, as he calls it, DJing for tonight. Uh, so he is uh, sort of really running the tech uh, program and um, a big thank you to, to Dale in all of the effort that he's put in to make this happen tonight. We also have Stephen Van Ryan, who's uh, also joining us tonight, not actually speaking, but uh, part of the development assessments team. Uh, that is actually working on this proposal. Uh, in terms of our proponent um, representatives tonight, um, we, uh, because of the questions that, the type of questions that have come forward from the 
uh, forum. Uh, the proponent has um, decided that uh, what we really need to hear tonight from is the, the key experts that have worked on, on the proposal. So to do that, we've got Sarah Old, we've got Martin Haig, uh, Jim Antonopoulos, and Terry Burkett, who will be uh, addressing some of the questions that have come through from the forum previous to this conference. And then to provide some community perspective, uh, we've, uh, we're going to be hearing from Simon Muir and from Pam Hall. And big thanks to those two uh, who, uh, and we, we just felt the uh, internet connections may have been slightly dodgy, so we needed to uh, quickly go back to them and ask them if they wouldn't mind um, videoing their presentation. And that's what we'll see tonight. Uh, so a big thank you to Simon and Pam for, for doing that for us. All right, uh, we're going to move now to just giving you the background on uh, what we've already heard in terms of the key issues raised in the submissions. Uh, just a reminder that this document was made available uh, in the conference resources section on the Engage Vic website. So I know uh, many of you that have been engaged with the forum will have, um, have, have had a look at that um, summary. So it's, it uh, has quite a bit of detail in it. What I'm going to do is just really give you the headlines of some of the issues that have been raised in the submissions. So there was um, concerns and issues raised about odour, uh, about noise, about dust, about greenhouse gas emissions, drainage issues, the flood risk, uh, risk to surface water and groundwater, wastewater management, human health risks, compliance with EPA acts, policies, regulations and guidelines and, uh, and biosecurity. In addition to that, there were quite a few uh, key issues raised in the submissions, but they fall outside the scope of EPA. And these were uh, Aboriginal and cultural heritage issues, trucks and traffic impacts uh, external to the site, planning issues which have to do with zoning and impacts on property values, biodiversity impacts, visual amenity and some of the other issues uh, that were raised in the submissions uh, as well. Um, so Stephen, I'll just bring you in here and uh, see if you'd like to add to um, my overview there, but uh, particularly to clarify, because there was quite a bit to do with drainage uh, and surface water issues. So Steve, perhaps if you can also just clarify what uh, falls within and outside scope. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Kath. So I guess just to cover off on the, the general items there, obviously our act and our legislation only enable us to cover certain things in our decision making process. And so Kath has outlined there on the screen some other things which we can't consider that, that might be a consideration for other permissions that this proposal will need to obtain. But specifically on the, the drainage and sort of water quality issue, issues with drainage essentially will be outside EPA's decision making power through the works approval. We will have regard to quality of water that leaves the site, whether that be planned leave or um, ability of the site to contain the amount of water that they need to on site, that kind of thing. But as for water going off site and going into drainage areas, that'll, that's a, a council matter to address. Thanks, Steve. All right, um, so now we're going to go to um, dealing with, uh, we'll go into a bit of a and a session. And uh, as I said at the start, these are some of the um, questions that came up um, from the forum. So I better just summarise some of those key issues that were raised in the forum, um, just to give you uh, that background. Um, so we had um, questions. Uh, so part of the forum was for people to post questions. And some of the questions raised had to do with the adequacy of drainage and the flood risk, odour risk, 
management of stockpile material noise, the 500 metre buffer zone guideline, and some of the relationships with the uh, planning process and just how um, that, that works, as well as uh, risks to human health. Uh, we also were asked people in the forum about some of the potential options um, that could be considered if the proposal is approved, what might be some of the options that could help reduce some of the uh, impacts um, or reduce some of the issues and concerns that have been raised. Some of those options included enclosure, enclosures of uh, the whole site, enclosures of stockpiles, enclosures of truck wash, that sort of thing. Um, reducing access times and days was also put forward, landscaping, keeping truck to the truck traffic to the north of the site so that it's um, at a greater distance away from the housing that is close by and the storm water improving storm water management and uh, some other options around flooring and clean clearing and cleaning frequency of that flooring. So uh, let's now go to uh, the questions um, that came up uh, and received from the forum. So we might go first then to uh, the adequacy of drainage and flood risk, uh, given what Stephen has clarified as to what's within the scope of uh, EPA and what's outside. Uh, Sarah, uh, can we get some comments or if you'd like to throw to one of the uh, experts to um, make some further comments on adequacy of drainage in yeah, the design. Yeah, I'm actually, uh, actually going to um, throw this one over to Martin Haig from Premise. So he's an environmental engineer that's worked on the project. Over to you, Martin. Hi, Kat. Thanks, Sarah. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, I'm tuning in from Orange in New South Wales. Um, and just as a bit of background to myself, um, I'm an environmental engineer, been in um, consulting uh, for about 30 years. Um, and this is the uh, 12th sale yard development that uh, our company's been involved with. So uh, over that time, we've seen these facilities develop in terms of their complexity and their, their style. Um, and all of them have been a similar style of development with a roofed uh, yard area and integrated, what I call an integrated water cycle management system that um, looks to make benefit of uh, water that can be captured on the site. In terms of stormwater management, um, what the, the principal aim is to separate catchments um, within the development and treat the runoff from those catchments accordingly. What you're looking at there is, is, a, is a site layout and we've, we've shaded the various catchments that uh, are present on the, on the facility. And they range from the roof catchment. Um, then we've got the blue area, which is the catchment that drains to the surface water wetland. Then we've got the effluent system, which is a fully contained uh, catchment. And I'll go through a bit more detail of this in a minute. And then outside of that, we've got what we've, we've just generally called there the clean water catchment. So our approach to managing stormwater here is to raise the entire development that is represented essentially by the blue area up above the surrounding area so that it can't interact with the clean water or general, general runoff from areas around it. And that clean water is then diverted fully around the facility uh, using a system of drains and grass swales, et cetera. The roof water, obviously we're going to capture that and put it into tanks and reuse as much of that as we can. Um, and that obviously helps reduce the potable demand for the facility. The, I'll talk the effluent before I go to, to the stormwater side of it. The effluent system is, is a fully enclosed system. So areas where the trucks are washed down, areas where the solids are managed, um, are fully enclosed and separated from all other drainage systems through construction of curbs, uh, gutters, drains and the like. And that is then pumped across to the, to the treatment ponds, um, which are there to provide a level of pre-treatment prior to discharging the, the waste off site. Those treatment ponds themselves are raised uh, up above the surrounding ground so that no external surface water can get into those ponds. 
and they have also have a free board so that their operating level is is about 900 mils below the top of the bank which means that if there's a big rainfall event there's plenty of capacity in those ponds to capture that rainfall event uh, without spilling in fact you'd need 900 mils of rainfall to get anywhere uh, in a single event that is to make them fill the, the concept with the, um, I'm probably touching on to effluent management at this, this stage, but I, I, I probably will just to cover off. So the concept with the effluent management system is to provide a level of pre-treatment to the, to the wastewater prior to it discharging to sewer. So we've got ponds there that are called facultative ponds. Um, they will be what we call mechanically aerated facultative ponds, where there's an aerated upper zone and a deeper anaerobic zone. The role of the aerated upper, uh, upper zone is to control odour. It will overflow into a fully aerobic pond, uh, which will have floating aerators and keep that pond in a fully aerobic state. The style of aerator is such that it's a bubble diffuser. It diffuses bubbles beneath the surface. It's not one of those ones that splashes the water around and creates a lot of aerosol. Once it's treated in that, it will overflow into a um, pump station, which will discharge to sewer. The arrangement of that pumping will be such that um, it would be done in consultation with the local authority so that we could determine when uh, we are able to pump to the sewer. And that would be designed to avoid peak flow times in the sewer, which typically occur in the morning and night, so that we don't overload sewer. And what we the way we manage that is we buffer it in the aerobic pond so that we can match the sewer capacity with uh, what we discharge from the site. So having separated all those catchments, we're left with the blue area, which is what we call the catchment that goes to the surface water wetland. And this work, this is where the stormwater management system comes into play. That area is, is a trafficable area that has trucks and vehicles um, and it's not heavily contaminated. It's, it's similar to an urban type development. So we direct all of that runoff around into a constructed stormwater wetland and that wetland is designed to capture and store a portion of that runoff such that the water discharging from the site does so at the same rate as it currently does. And also the wetland provides water quality treatment and our modelling is indicating that the wetland system can achieve a water quality discharging from the site similar to what leaves the site now. So the basis and, and theory around these, these types of developments and in fact any sort of larger industrial type development is that we have to have a stormwater system in place that ensures there's no off-site impacts or no off-site changes in peak flows or flooding patterns as a result of the development. And that's what the conceptual design has achieved. It's been modelled uh, using overland flood modelling uh, process, and it shows that the divert it, it doesn't change off-site flooding impacts or drainage impacts um, as a result of the development. I hope that answers uh, the initial question, Kath. Are you there, Kath? You might be on mute. Sorry, oh. <laughs> haven't learned to drive the plane properly. Um, so thank you for that. And uh, I think there was a question that may have come through in the meeting chat around um, taking into account its position on a on a flood plain. Did you want to make a comment around that? So in response to that, I, I suppose I'll just reiterate what we're saying about keeping, making sure the facility is raised above the surrounding land so that um, it doesn't interact with the, um, the clean water catchment and then ensuring that the on-site uh, stormwater management system being the constructed surface water wetland achieves that goal of uh, controlling discharge from the site to, to current levels such that there's no off-site impact caused by the development. As I also said that, that we have modelled this in a, um, in a what we call a two-dimensional flood model, uh, which looks at how water moves across the, the ground 
and it doesn't cause any change in um, flooding patterns. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, so we might also now go to, there was a question around uh, odour uh, and risks to odour. I wonder if uh, we can hear a bit more about um, the modelling conclusion that there is a low risk of odour beyond the site uh, boundary. Uh, Sarah, who will we go to for that? Um, so that's Terry Burkett from Ectimo. Thank you, Terry. Would you like to make a comment just a bit more on the odour risks and just maybe what what is um, going into the model that means that it's a low risk of odour? Uh, certainly. Um, yes, Terry Burkett's my name. Um, I basically work for um, a company called Ectimo. Um, I've been involved in the odour and air monitoring um, uh, field for about 30 years. Um, currently one of the directors at Ectimo and um, basically what we do here is um, largely air monitoring and, 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 and odour testing. Um, our core business is basically to, to provide data and uh, measurement services to industry uh, consulting and regulatory authorities so that um, informed decisions can be made. Um, ECTMO is NADA accredited, um, which basically means our testing and so on is overseen by a governing body um, that, that oversees testing laboratories. Um, I've been involved in quite a few odour assessment projects over the years from various different sort of areas such as landfills, wastewater treatment plants, and also um, the intensive animal industry uh, along with others. Um, I, I guess as a as a um, overview to the um, approach that we that we basically use to assess the potential concerns around odour um, was that given the Given the long worry proposal is obviously a new site, we can't do direct measurements on that site. So what what we have done is we've chosen a another facility that is is comparable in the way um, it operates and the and the componentry that they have on site, and that was one at Mortlake. So I guess the the general approach was to. Um, was to have a look at the facility at Mortlake, uh, conduct some, some odour assessments and observations at Mortlake so that we could apply that to the Long Worry site. The, both facilities um, or the proposed facility at Long Worry and the facility at um, uh, Mortlake, basically both are looking at having a soft floor. Um, I guess the key elements are a wastewater treatment plant. Um, as I said, the soft floor, obviously, um, sales occurring at different times, um, truck wash down um, and manure stockpiles um, would sort of be the key components that could be reasonably considered to give rise to to give rise to odor um, and, and and basically the the overall approach was there's traditionally two ways to do that one is to measure odor at the source and model that using mathematical models and so on to to make a prediction as to what the odor could could be at the proposed site. Um, the other approach, which which is a newer approach um, based on EPA guidelines, is to conduct odour surveys on the site where we physically go to the site and we conduct odour observations by trained observers um, that have been screened with an appropriate sense of smell to take direct measurements of what the 
plume reach, in other words, how far the odour plume may go. Um, and that was that was the sort of approach we used here, um, rather than relying on theoretical modelling. And then basically we took that information, um, scaled it accordingly based on what the predicted um, throughput through the long worry um, sale yards was as far as numbers and numbers of cattle and sales of the various different types. Coupled that with the um, prevailing weather conditions at Long Worry um, to then make predictions on um, how far we would expect the um, odour plume to go. Um, basically, the, the odours can be basically divided into two, or the odour sources, I should say, can basically be divided into um, uh, primary source and secondary sources. Um, the primary sources are those that we considered to be the main contributors to odour, and that was basically the animals on site on a sale day was the, was the primary contributor. Secondary contributors, which had a lesser impact, were the wastewater treatment ponds, manure stockpiles, um, truck washing, and also the sheds when they were empty, in other words, not on sale days, where some of the um, management of practices occurred, such as um, um, uh, turning the litter um, and, and so on. Um, what we basically found was that the um, is that the contribution from the manure stockpile um, and the truck truck washing facility. Um, was only detectable at, at levels of around about 40 metres from those sources. We looked at the manure stockpile under a worst case scenario where the manure was being continuously turned and disturbed by a front end loader to simulate loading into a truck. Um, and we also conducted these series of observations while truck washing um, was occurring. Um, we also looked at the other secondary, main secondary source, which was the sheds themselves during um, disturbance of the litter, um, where we had no animals present, but we're looking purely at the litter. And the observations there were that whilst odour could be detected within the shed itself, once we got to the perimeter of the shed, we were only detecting relatively weak odour. Um, which which was considered unlikely to to be a cause of complaint. As I said, the primary the primary um, contributor was the animals during the sale day. Um, the outcome of it was basically that um, for the various types of routine sales um, that that were to occur, um, we were predicting um, based on based on this that we weren't expecting impact at, at any of the nearby sensitive receivers. Um, the only scenario where we expected there was some possibility of that was a worst case scenario of um, non- Sorry, we might have to wrap you up shortly. Uh, we, need it. we need quite brief answers for, for our okay. session today. Well, well, that that probably that probably wraps it up. I was pretty much there, so apologies okay. if I've gone over on that. Yeah, no worries. Okay, so so thanks, uh, Terry. Now, look, uh, I I might just go back to uh, Martin uh, for a moment. There was just a couple of questions coming through uh, around um, if you are raising the ground level, will that not uh, increase the runoff? And I think there was also questions around um, that needed clarification around uh, the sewerage that may may be connected to. If you could say something a little bit about that as well. Okay, thanks, Kath. Um, yeah, I've seen the. I've been looking down the questions. So yeah, uh, thanks. To answer those couple, um, raising the ground actually doesn't cause more runoff. Um, 
and in fact by putting a roof in and putting in areas where the direct rainfall will be captured such as the ponds actually reduces runoff so um, just raising the ground itself will not generate extra runoff um, in terms of the the sewer uh, the, the proponent has to uh, in consultation with the local authority um, make an extension or extend the sewer extend the sewer main to the site to enable uh, the connection to occur I also noted um, there's a question there about that um, we need to change some flooding patterns in the area so um, that's obviously a pre-existing condition um, or, or occurrence um, as I said the intent is to not make anything any worse um, but you know perhaps there may be an opportunity to uh, you know make some improvements with this development if, if um, to fix up current drainage issues okay great uh, thanks Martin and um, I'm just wondering if you were able to make a comment too around um, there's been a few suggestions about why not have a concrete floor rather than a soft floor is that something that you would answer or is that someone else it's Based on my experience with these uh, facilities, that comes down to animal welfare. Um, so it's not my area of expertise, um, but it is definitely related to animal welfare uh, through the facility. All right, great, thank you. Now there was um, another lot of, uh, a few questions made around uh, noise. Um, and the model suggesting that the noise, noise levels will be above the recommended levels. Uh, so Sarah, can we have uh, a bit further comment on that and who, who would be saying that? Um, just in terms of impact of local conditions on, on noise levels and yep. when are we expecting noise levels to be above those recommended levels? Uh, Jim Antonopoulos from SLR Consulting is gonna speak to this. Great. Thanks, Jim. Uh, hello, I think I'm on. Um, you can hear me? Is that all right? Am I working? Am I yes, on? you're working. Yes, good. Thank you. Uh, yeah, Jim Antonopoulos is my name. From uh, I'm a principal consultant at um, SLR Consulting Australia. Uh, I've got about 25 years experience and have been involved in quite a lot of um, environmental noise assessments and predictions um, and been involved in some of the recent uh, other sale yard projects as well. Um, so just to explain a little bit about the process, um, um, the, the, our, we also do modelling of, of the noise impacts. Um, our modelling inputs are really based on actual measurements of the some of the existing facilities. So I've gone and measured noise emissions from uh, truck loading, truck movements, um, truck washers, um, all, all matter of sources on the sites um, that have been used as the actual basis of all our modelling. Um, so the modelling itself obviously um, allows us to predict in every direction under um, all conditions. In, in actual fact, we don't um, consider specific conditions uh, and directions of when we actually assume it's a worst case um, a, a meteorological condition already to all receivers. So just, just to clarify, the algorithms we use already assume there's a wind blowing from every source to every receiver or that there's a partial temperature inversion or, or, uh, or, or a combination of both uh, already included in every direction, which can't actually happen, but it, I guess it paints an absolute worst case picture of what it would be to every receiver in every direction. Um, so yes, and of course, we've also modelled it during what's the peak activity of when there are the most amount of trucks, uh, most amount of activity, the truck wash being used, all happening at the same time for a, a, a snapshot, if you like, of the worst half hour of activity. Um, so under those conditions with, with peak activity and potentially with wind or t um, blowing from the source to the receivers, that's when we get, they're the, they're the presented levels in our, in our report. That, so that so all those things have to happen at the same time uh, to a particular receiver to get those um, you know marginal results or exceedances. Um, so that hopefully that answers sort of the, the level of conservatism in the calculations. 
OK, thank you. Um, thank you very much for that. Um, so there was a couple of other questions that I'm going to call on um, Stephen from EPA just to clarify. Uh, one was around the 500 metre uh, buffer zone, Stephen. Um, does the EPA take into account this recommended buffer distance when considering the works approval application? Yeah, thanks, Kath. So we will take into account the, the guidance where that buffer zone uh, is included, which is I think publication 1518. Now, if for those that have had a look at that publication, it has a, that buffer distance or separation distance listed in there, but it also confirms that within uh, EPA's assessment, we'll, we'll be concentrating on what, whether the proposal actually uh, can, can meet um, acceptable amounts of odour to whatever receptors might be around, whether or not they're in that buffer. And so we'll certainly consider things uh, where that, that don't comply with that as a default uh, setting, if you like. OK. Um, Thank you. Um, we're also just wanting a comment from you too, Stephen, about the relationship with the planning process. Yeah, sure. So I think there had been a little bit of confusion out there about uh, EPA's role in the planning process uh, as opposed to our role in administering this works approval decision. So for under the planning application for the planning permit, EPA can be a, a referral authority as it was this in this case. And just to confirm, EPA hasn't rejected anything to do with, with the planning application. Uh, we originally indicated that the, we didn't have enough information in order to accept or make a recommendation to Council to accept that application. However, we consider that our EPA's main role for this proposal is in administering a decision on the works approval. OK, thank you. And then the last one um, was oh, what, what am I doing here? Oh, it was on human health. So there was a lot of um, uh, questions that were asked relating to risk to human health. So as I understand it, uh, Stephen, EPA has requested a human health risk assessment be undertaken. Uh, once that's been done, that will be made publicly available. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Yeah. Yeah, great. All right, uh, we're going to move on now, um, but before we do, I'd just like to again thank you for all your questions and comments that are coming through in the Q&A feed. Uh, all of these will be compiled and uh, used as input into the conference report. Uh, we can't just, in the time we've got, we just simply cannot uh, address every single one of them, but they will be captured for that report. Um, and I should also say too that if you uh, think you like what someone else has written, you can certainly use the uh, thumbs up button rather than having to repeat what has already been uh, said in a comment. All right, so we're going to uh, move now um, on to hearing from uh, community. So community perspectives. Uh, as I said at the start, we've got uh, two uh, uh, presenters here uh, who will um, who have been kind enough to uh, say that they are happy to present. Uh, but as I said, there was uh, issues with technical um, or thoughts that it might might have been a bit dodgy their connections, and so they decided to go ahead with uh, posting some videos. So we're going to see that uh, now, and. Um, while you are listening to that, uh, I also want to hear from you. So for all of those people that are not uh, getting an opportunity to give a verbal presentation, please use the Q&A uh, uh, function. Uh, you can certainly raise your uh, any thoughts that you have around our two key objectives tonight. One is, are there any other additional concerns or issues that have not been raised before? Um, please put those in and if there's any additional potential options for resolving some of the issues and concerns 
that you think should be um, think you that you think should be considered by EPA, please put those forward as well. All right, so I think first off we're going to hear from uh, Simon. And Simon, I'm sorry, I might have said Simon Muir and it's Simon Parsons, I think that's come through on the uh, Q&A chat line. So I'm, my big apologies there, but we'll first hear from Simon and his um, video content. I am Simon Parsons. I'm a cattle farmer at Nearham East in Warwar Shire. I run between 350 and 450 head of cattle. I purchase weaners from markets and until recently I would sell finished bullocks in markets, predominantly Warrigal and Pakenham. I support the Thornell Road sale yard proposal, but at once I recognise the appropriateness and the value of the views of objectors. I can confirm that I have no pecuniary interest in Long Worry Sale Yards, Proprietary Limited, and the views I express here are mine and uncoached. In relation to the issues submitted by objectors as they relate to matters that fall to the EPA to consider, it appears to me firstly that proponents of the development have presented a comprehensive submission which aims to address all key issues. Secondly, as a lay person, it appears that all of the reasonable issues identified by opponents are capable of resolution contingent upon EPA providing guidance to the applicant as to requisite standards. Thirdly, and most saliently, opinions about highly technical matters put by opponents other than by their expert advocates are non-expert, normative and of contestable value. I'll turn to a couple of the objection issues shortly, but first I'll outline aspects of my support for the proposal. Despite increasing activity in non-agricultural sectors, agriculture remains the strongest income generator in Borbore Shire. Dairy is the dominant agricultural industry, and the Borbore Shire Municipal Strategic Statement strongly emphasises the importance of agriculture, noting, and I quote, highly productive agricultural land and extensive agricultural infrastructure and investment. The literature identifies the strength in industrial clusters which attract and maintain an aggregation of like industries and a range of inputs and infrastructures which support and benefit from the dominant cluster. Whereas many industrial clusters are portable, agriculture is not. In particular, industries like dairy are highly reliant on local natural resources, including soil fertility and rainfall. The steady and inexorable decline of irrigation-based agriculture, including dairy, emphasises the importance of highly productive non-irrigation-based dairy and beef production in Borbore Shire. Borbore Shire is by far the dominant dairy production LGA in Melbourne's outer peri-urban region and one of very few productive non-irrigation-based dairy clusters in Australia. A modern, environmentally and economically sustainable livestock market is essential infrastructure for dairy and cattle producers in the Borbore Shire. Both the development and the ongoing operation of the sale yards will employ many people and the ownership and management model, predominantly comprising farmers and livestock agents, I suspect reluctant entrepreneurs, but without viable future options essentially push to develop infrastructure which will otherwise disappear, is a long-term economically sustainable model. Transport of livestock over long distances is expensive and livestock suffer from transit. With the imminent closure of the Warrigal sale yards and the mooted short-term closure of Pakenham, Borbor dairy producers face much longer and more expensive transit issues. If a viable sale yard facility is acknowledged as essential infrastructure to Borbor Shire's largest economic sector, then it must have a site. Essential site characteristics include compatible zoning, such as farming zone, generally level land, easy access to the Princess Freeway and access to the requisite services and utilities at a digestible cost. It sounds a lot like the proposal in view. Returning to objections as summarised in the key issues summary, objections are generally either legitimate with some capacity for amelioration or irrelevant to this process, lacking expert evidence or theory. Putting aside site characteristics noted previously, which are essentially land use planning issues. My interpretation of the nature of the objections is that with a couple of exceptions that I'll address shortly, the essence of opposition is articulated in E5, property value and zoning, ergo value. 
Planning references in this section are not, as I interpret the process, relevant to an EPA assessment. My interpretation is that only issues summarised in sections A, B, C and D2 are potentially relevant to an EPA assessment, although some noise and wastewater treatment issues are duplicated elsewhere. Addressing a couple of specific objections, at A1.2, concern odour will be comparable to minus rest sale yard. My understanding is that the minus rest sale yard processes sheep which have a high odour risk, but sheep will not be processed at Long Worry. At A1.8, there is concern the town will smell like a petrol station from truck fumes. And A2.7, concern cattle trucks through town until 10pm will create noise pollution. My understanding is that access and egress arrangements to the site are designed to prevent trucks from entering the site from the south and exiting the site to the south, which is the town approach. At A2.6, concern the baseline monitoring at the site is inadequate. Well, it either is or isn't adequate, and the EPA will determine that. In respect to D2 biosecurity, I understand that the proponents have commissioned a biohazards management plan. At E7.3, concern other locations were not proposed for the sale yard. Now, this is an important point. It is the case that the Shire is bounded to the south by the Strzelecki Range and to the north by the tail of the Dividing Range. Sites suitable for any large facility are located exclusively in the flat valley between the two, which the Princess Freeway follows. Additionally, there are only two overpass interchanges capable of efficiently and safely accommodating large trucks on the freeway in the Shire, namely at Sand Road, which is the access point to the subject site, and at Darnham. There certainly is not an abundance of suitable sites. Many objections express concern for imagined future events and circumstances, including governance failure by statutory institutions such as local planning policy, and whether technical issues such as whether water treatment strategies are adequate, whether groundwater monitoring procedures, etc., are adequate, and so on. These don't warrant comment from me, rather, they are precisely the technical matters that EPA will determine to be adequate or not. Generally, my impression is that in the context of this EPA investigation, legitimate concerns of valid issues are limited to emissions of odour, noise, wastewater, light and biohazards. My advice is that the proponent has addressed or is in the process of addressing all of these issues. I'm confident that EPA will properly evaluate the measures proposed by the proponent and if found to be inadequate, it will require appropriate actions. A number of large sale yard facilities have been constructed around Victoria in the past 10 years or so. No doubt all of them have had to achieve EPA approval, as they should. Assuming that there are no unusual site-specific peculiarities, I'm confident the proposal will achieve EPA approval. My confidence is based on the proponent's demonstrable determination to satisfy all consent authorities' requirements. By the way, whilst, whilst I support the proposal, I do so on condition that the project satisfies all EPA standards. Finally, I would say that in anticipation that EPA will approve the project, perhaps with conditions, it is up to the Shire to address non-EPA related objector concerns articulated in the key issues summary, and to do so having reference to its own municipal strategic statement, and importantly, the primacy of agriculture in the economic hierarchy of the Shire. Thank you. Okay, thanks uh, very much for that, Simon. We're going straight now into Pam's um, presentation. Sorry. The EPA has summarised the key issues and concerns from the submissions. It is eight pages long, and all of those issues are of great concern for those of us that will be impacted if the development proceeds. This development will detrimentally impact the physical features of the wider area and is unable to meet EPA noise and odour requirements. The development is likely to spread infection and disease to humans, pets and livestock in the surrounding area through air and waterborne pathogens. EPA recommends a separation distance of 500 metres between the sale yard and nearest homes. There are at least 11 homes within 500 metres of this proposed activity zone. It is impossible to mitigate the effects of this proposal to such an extent that these 11 homes will not be adversely affected. One home is only 100 metres away, four are within 200 metres. 
The odour modelling is inaccurate. Mortlake has a different climate to Long Worry. It's based on limited weather data and does not consider seasonal variation. Odour only from cattle is included. The treatment pond, solid waste and trucks delivering the cattle will not smell. It assumes that odour will only occur during sales, although cattle will be present most days, and scarifying of yards will also increase the odour. The proponent states that odour will travel no further than 229 metres. However, the proponents for Mortlake stated that odour will be experienced further than 500 metres. The odour will prevent us from enjoying our outdoor areas, the main reason that we live on our rural properties. No opening our windows, no hanging clothes out to dry, no outdoor entertaining, no pleasant summer days hanging out in our own backyards. Mosquitoes and flies will be increased and will spread pathogens. But then the chemicals proposed to manage the problem will contaminate the air, groundwater and rainwater tanks of our homes and will destroy local bee colonies. Cattle infected with various diseases can appear healthy enough to sell, but will shed pathogens in their manure and urine that can remain in contaminated flooring for years and can be dispersed for many kilometres. Dust will contain viruses, parasites and bacteria. The proponents suggest the risk of infection is low. However, the possible consequences are long-term illness such as Q fever or even death in the case of leptospirosis. Any increased risk is unacceptable so close to so many family homes. How could we invite friends and family to visit when they could be at risk? No more family gatherings, no more birthday parties for our children. The effluent from toilets will be discharged into the treatment ponds. There will be human waste and human diseases in the solid waste piles. The process of removing the solids from the ponds takes three days and will produce extremely high odour, but apparently that's okay. It's not very often. Dust, pathogens and chemicals will contaminate our drinking water. This will worsen illness, respiratory disease, heart disease, asthma and allergies in us and our families, pets and livestock. The proposed fortnightly dust inspection regime is totally inadequate as dust will become problematic very quickly. Scarifying the yards is unacceptable. It will increase dust, odour and pathogen load in the flooring. Manure and urine soiled flooring should be removed after each sale as recommended by Meat and Livestock Australia. Stockpiled solids will be a source of odour, air pollution, water pollution and disease and should not be stored for the proposed four weeks. This will be, these will be accessible by vermin as well as native animals and birds that will then spread the pathogens. The solid stockpile will not be watered since the point is to dry it out. This guarantees it will be a source of contaminated dust. The base of the wastewater ponds will be very close to groundwater level with only a thin plastic liner and the sides of the ponds are only 600 millimetres above ground level. This seems inadequate for protection against flooding and groundwater contamination. Runoff and overflow of effluent, chemicals, grease, oil, fuel, cleaning, cleaning agents and other pollutants on and from the site will contaminate groundwater and will pollute the underground spring that runs through the property, as well as nearby dams and bores that are used to water livestock. Further afield, this contamination will pollute the Bunyip River system, which flows into the Western Port catchment. The flood assessment does not sufficiently consider the common flash flooding events that occur several times per year at this site. So the development will add to the existing substantial drainage issues in the area. The development will not contain 100 millimetres of rainfall within seven days or 40 millimetres of rainfall within just one hour. Once the sale yard's water system reaches capacity, all additional rain will fall, will overflow and flood our homes. This overflow will include the sewerage ponds, catastrophically contaminating all stormwater drains and properties in the area. This is the wrong site to build up and on. The entire sale yard will be built up 1 to 1.8 metres from current ground level. This will increase the distance that noise, odour and dust will travel and will increase the flow rate of runoff and in turn the likelihood of flooding the surrounding properties. Noise requirements will not be met even with the noise barrier which is totally inappropriate in a rural area. 
cattle and truck noise, loading, unloading, truck engine brakes, yard gates slamming, trucks going over the stock grid at the entrance any time of the day or night. The noise assessment has only considered the noise of trucks moving around the site, but trucks travelling to and from the site will also increase noise through Longwarrie Township, all along Sand Road and on Thornell Road, worse as it is unsealed. Traffic noise will be further increased by their planned noise barrier, reverberating noise to our homes. Truck and cattle noise at light will cause sleep disturbance and during the day will affect those on shift work and with young children. The noise of the distressed cattle and calves will be psychologically disturbing, especially for the many children in the neighbouring homes. There is not enough that could be done that would make this proposal acceptable at the proposed location. It is too close to too many homes. Only one suggestion that would make the proposal suitable would be for the Longwari sale yards to be developed as a state-of-the-art online sale yard venue, negating the need for any of the proposed impositions. Some suggestions that might slightly decrease the ongoing impacts are as follows. There should be no sales or related activity on site no, on, at any, any time on weekends or public holidays. There should be a strict curfew for activity no later than 9pm and no earlier than 8am with very high penalties for activity beyond the curfew. Truck washers must not be used beyond curfew times. Sales must not begin before 9am on any day. This will decrease traffic during peak times when locals are travelling to work and school and will prevent the increased risk to school children at the nearby bus stop. There should be access directly from the Princess Freeway with no access from Sand Road or Thornell Road. The roadway on site should be contained to the northern side of the yards. The yards should be completely enclosed and on a concrete base covered with a soft floor. There should be no stockpiling of spent floor or solid waste. However, if necessary, the solid waste stockpile must be much smaller and be completely enclosed and removed from the site at least weekly. The noise barrier should be placed right next to the noise producing area as far from the boundary of the site as possible. The landscaping zone must consist of mature trees with sufficient height and density of foliage to mitigate the visual amenity prior to commencement of any business. There should be no wastewater treatment system on site. All wastewater, including toilets, should be directly discharged to the new sewer. Manure and urine soaked flooring should be removed after every sale instead of scarifying. Developers of the site must contribute substantially to local stormwater drainage improvements. Developers must cover the costs of water filtration and soundproofing improvements like double glazing and insulation to all nearby homes. Decrease the build up height below one metre maximum. Decrease the roof height of the yards. Construction must also abide by curfew times such that no activity should occur prior to 8am on weekdays, no activity on weekends or public holidays. Construction must not create excessive dust and must not increase the risk of flooding to nearby properties. Okay. Thank you, Pam. Um, and thank you to everyone who has been uh, contributing to the Q&A uh, stream. As, again, as I said, uh, this will all form part of the conference report. They, these comments will be captured and um, I will refer to those as input into the report. So we're going to now close up. Um, it's getting, uh, it's past eight o'clock and I did say we wanted to finish at eight. I just want to quickly um, hand over to Stephen again just to provide some closing remarks and particularly about the next steps from here, Stephen. Yeah, thanks, Kev. So as we've already touched on, Kev will be producing a report based on all of the, everyone's input tonight and in the, the previous uh, forums and she'll get that back to EPA in the near future and what we'll do with that is take that information and the recommendations within that report and consider them within our assessment for the, the entire works approval. 
Once we've uh, finished, oh, sorry, I should say we uh, we currently we don't have a deadline for the submission because we're still we have asked the applicant for some further information, which means the uh, the decision is delayed. But once we've received all the information that we would like, we will obviously finalise our assessment and then our decision will be published for all to see on Engage Vic and submitters will be directly notified of that. Uh, if once the decision's made, if, if people are interested in understanding uh, appeal rights and how to make appeals, uh, they can find information on that for on EPA's website or on the Engage Vic website or even at VCAT's own website. If an approval is uh, achieved for this application, uh, then there's beyond that there'll be uh, obviously construction of this facility but that would be followed by commissioning periods where the applicant will be asked to prove the performance uh, as was outlined in their works approval and then beyond that um, there may be further uh, operating permissions required. I think that's all. I just want to also quickly say thanks to everyone for their participation tonight. Obviously a new experience for us here at EPA as it may be for lots of you. So thank you. Thanks Stephen. And yes, I'll just reiterate that by saying a big thanks to all of you for taking the time to attend. Thank you for your comments, your questions. Thank you for participating in the forum beforehand and posting uh, questions which helped us really shape up uh, the areas that we're going to focus on tonight and I, I would like to again acknowledge the input of all speakers uh, and particularly our community representatives that uh, spoke tonight. I will also uh, just bouncing off from what Stephen said about this being the first time uh, we've used an online platform for a 20B conference. Uh, EPA then are quite interested in your feedback on participating in a digital process. Uh, it was swapped to this format, as you would imagine, uh, because of the uh, restrictions in gatherings. Uh, so EPA are keen to hear your feedback. They will be sending out a survey to all participants and will be really keen to get your feedback on the online forum component and the conference event. With that, I'll say thank you and good night. You can go and have a nice cuppa now and relax. Thanks everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thanks, Bye.